So warmly welcome to the first seminar of the semester. And um, we have the great pleasure of having Keith Tribe here during the entire academic year. And Keith will address the issue of the situation in the moral sciences in Cambridge in the 19th century. Um, this, of course, is a theme that is extremely important for an understanding of the history of the social sciences and the human sciences more broadly. It is also, of course, of great interest for anybody who cares to uh, focus on the history of universities. Uh, in this respect, Keith is in a grand tradition. Um, there are many important works uh, which have been devoted specifically to the situation of, um, of uh, research in, uh, in Cambridge in the 19th century. I'm one now minor modern classic is the work of the Berkeley historian Sheldon Rothblatt, uh, which is it's called The Revolution of the Dons uh, and focuses on Cambridge. It came out in the first edition in 1969 and then in a new edition in 1981. And Sheldon has kept writing on this subject ever since. There is also uh, a book that many of you may have read. I don't know if you normally refer to that yourself, but that is the book that is often, often overlooked, a book published by, written by Reba Soffer already in the late 70s, Ethics and Revolution, uh, the Social Sciences in England in the period 1870-1914. And she came out a quarter of a century later with another little book with the strangely Foucauldian title Discipline and Power, but essentially it is a study of history teaching and historical research in Cambridge and Oxford. Uh, well, basically in the same period, the late 19th, early 20th century, and focusing on the absolutely crucial role that the Regis professors in these two universities had for the formation of what came to be seen as professional historical research. And also, of course, she pinpoints the enormous public influence that these fields had. I think a very large number of the members of the British delegation to the Versailles Peace Treaty negotiations were Balliol College graduates in his history. Um, but there are many, many others. But it is a fascinating thing. And of course, in this case, it's very important that her focus is on history writing. And of course, the social sciences in Britain really didn't emerge within these two old universities, but in newer institutions, primarily, of course, the London School of Economics and Political Science, Sciences. Um, I would say one or two words about Keith also. Uh, he has a long, a long, he has a long um, history with, of relationship with scholars in Uppsala, not least uh, our mutual friend Lars Magnusson. There was actually a time when Keith, together with Lars Magnusson, Istvan Hont, a number of other people, were engaged, embarking on a project that led to a number of results, but that not, never was fulfilled in its completeness. Um, that was a project focusing on the history of economics in the 18th century. Keith's own training was originally at the University of Essex, which of course played a important, very important role for the modern social sciences in Britain in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and up to the present, actually. Um, he subsequently went on to do research, graduate work at Cambridge, um, which resulted in a, in a work on, um, again, on classical um, 18th century, primarily on 18th century economics. And this work, I think, is the one that was subsequently published in the book you mentioned in the handout, Land, Labor, and Economic Discourse. PhD was in 1977. He later was, as you've seen, um, briefly worked at, also as a guest researcher before that, in Germany, which is something you share, actually, with a distinguished Indian historian of science, Kapil Raj, <laughs> who equally cosmopolitan as you are. Um, Keith also subsequently worked uh, at the Keele University, where he was teaching both in, first in sociology and later in economics. He has held visiting positions abroad, including having an Alexander von Humboldt scholarship at the University of Heidelberg, but he has also worked at the Max Planck Institute for History at Göttingen, uh, 
this is an institute that no longer exists in its previous incarnation. There are some, there are a number of important persons who are still working in Göttingen. But Göttingen at that time, of course, was a very important site for anybody doing historical work on the history of the human and social sciences, and still is, actually. For those who are interested in this particular Max Planck Institute, which is a very important one because it has complex links to preceding institutions uh, before the Second World War, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, uh, there is a little book that you probably have read, which is called Geschichte jenseits der Universität, came out a couple of years ago, that traces all these linkages. But the paradoxical situation is that there is no Max Planck Institute for history, for general history currently. Um, one important thing that Keith has done throughout his career is to translate works primarily from German into English. So he has been working with two of the towering figures in German cultural life in the post-Second World War period, namely Wilhelm Hennis and uh, Reinhard Kozelek. And I still think your book, uh, the translations of Kozelek's works, Future's Past, is the standard book that came out in several editions. Um, we met actually the first time at a conference that took place in Berlin the weekend when the wall came down, <laughs> devoted to an understanding of the history and societal role of the social sciences. And you wrote a wonderful contribution to the book that came out. Um, but we have kept contact ever since. Um, Keith was here a couple of years ago in the fall of 2012 as my guest, very briefly. But one result that we at least can take a small part of the credit for is the book that came out in 2015 and which is entitled The Economy of the Word, Language, History and Economics. Um, last year he also came out with a book that I have not read, which, which looks exceedingly interesting, which he edited with Pat Hudson, The Contradictions of Capital in the 21st Century, The Piketty Opportunity, which I think, I mean, it's a very thorough review of the, economic, the empirical basis of Pickett, Piketty's argument and also a theoretical discussion, which I will certainly read very carefully. I should perhaps finally take not too much time from uh, uh, Keith's time, uh, time of presenting his work, but I would like to mention that he has been on the editorial board of several journals. One of them, not surprisingly, is the European Journal of the History of Economic Thought, uh, but he was also one of the, you were among the initiators, I think that's fair to say, of the CUP journal, Economy and Society, uh, uh, which is an important journal, really, and a journal which we have kept contact with over the years, because we have here at the Collegium, well, we have small groups of scholars in residence every year, but we also try to keep a few long-term engagements, and one of those has to do precisely with the role of the relationship between economic sciences and the other social and human sciences. And for a very long time, that has involved reflections on the history of economic thought. But it's also included in recent, not recent years, recent decades, I would say, the recent past one and a half decade, has involved a lot of work on the philosophy of economics. And economy and society is very broad. It's not quite so philosophically oriented as econ economics and in, in, economics and philosophy, but it is a very broad and important journal, and we are very happy that you are here, and, uh, and we look forward immensely to listening to you. Thank you so much. I'm talking about Cambridge, and first of all, I should say that I'm not talking about Cambridge because I'm English or I have some kind of affiliation to what could be called the Cambridge School, a Cambridge School of Historiography associated uh, in my mind particularly with the work of Istvan Hunt and Mike Sonnenscher. Um, now I, and nor the fact that I actually my graduate work was done in Cambridge. Um, there is a kind of whole tradition in the history of economic thought of, of Cambridge cent centralism as it were that everything comes out of Cambridge and that's not a story very very much it's an Italian um, for different reasons, Italian-English story that I'm not presenting here today. What I'm talking about is, as I'll introduce in a moment, is what I'd call the Cambridge moment, which is from the later 
19th century to around about the 20s and 30s, and I'll describe this arc of how Cambridge becomes central to the development of the discipline of economics uh, in, in the world, um, and then how that centrality fades and what, what the reason for that is. And uh, the paper I circulated, um, which was mainly, which is, it was generated by a workshop uh, about three years ago on uh, religion and, and political economy, and I wrote about uh, Henry Sidgwick because he is a moral philosopher who was closely related to the development of the moral sciences in Cambridge in the later 19th century, um, and who was famously always described as having been, uh, having had major doubts about his Christian faith and so forth. But it, um, what I was trying to do there in that paper was to detach Sidgwick from a lot of prejudice that had, uh, that has surrounded his name, um, that is old fashioned and whatever, um, and somehow re re-centralize him in the moral sciences. And, and so that's why I wanted to circulate that. But I'm not going to talk about Sidgwick primarily uh, today. I'm going to talk actually about the moral sciences tripos and also, very importantly, about the mathematical tripos and how actually teaching was done in Cambridge uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the 19th century, um, not, not even just in the later 19th century. So first of all, just to sort of set the scene, so the... Um, so I was a bit flustered because uh, uh, the picture, which is in the next uh, next image, came up with um, with with the same thing. So um, this is a quotation from John Maynard Keynes. Um, the arc, really, I'm talking about starts in the mid 19th century. Alf Alfred Marshall is central to it. Um, John Maynard Keynes, whose father is John Neville Keynes, who's a, a, a student of, of uh, Sidgwick's in the Moral Science Tripos. Um, John Maynard Keynes graduates with a maths degree in 1905. He is coached by M Alfred Marshall in economics to take the civil service exam. Um, he writes, over the course of a few months, 19 uh, essays for Marshall. Uh, on economics, and, and then he goes into the India office, and then eventually, in, in before the, uh, uh, the First World War, he becomes a Cambridge lecturer. Uh, and this quotation is from the foreword he wrote, the generic foreword he wrote, to the Cambridge Economic Handbook, which uh, handbooks, they were a series of, of, of uh, small books on particular issues like wages, supply and demand, industrial organization, the early titles. And what I want to draw your attention to is this idea that economics is not just a set of doctrines. It's um, a method rather than a doctrine. And really what uh, Keynes is summarizing here is a very Marshallian vision of the idea of modern economics as what uh, um, Marshall described as a toolbox that it wasn't a, a set structure of thought, it was a set of tools which would be applied to any particular policy problem that arose. So um, the uh, idea of a toolbox and the idea that this is the way in which one would approach modern problems is, is important. Maynard Keynes actually also uh, represents the end of, um, of the sort of phase I'm talking to, and particularly with his uh, general theory of 1936. So we go from the appointment of Marshall to the professor of, to be professor of political economy in Cambridge in late 1884 to the mid-1930s is basically the space I'm looking at. And what Marshall did uh, with his Cambridge position was to open up a, a space really within Cambridge were within the university system for a new discipline, which is, which is economics, what he called economics, not political economy anymore, economics. But what I'll show you towards the end of this, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, presentation is that this space became film, filled by something else by the 1930s and something else which was, had a rather curious uh, heritage. <clears throat> 
Um, and there's an importance here of a generational phasing, draw your attention to, that uh, Henry Sidgwick, who I'll talk a bit about, was born in 1838. Alfred Marshall, who in a sense succeeded his vision of what moral sciences should be, was only born uh, four years later in 1842. Similarly, Arthur Pigou, or A.C. Pigou, we should say, because no one ever called him Arthur, um, uh, Pigou, was born in 1877. He succeeded Marshall in the chair in 1908. Um, and already by the 1920s, he was regarded as, in a sense, a, 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 a rather passe figure. And so in the general theory, uh, Maynard Keynes's general theory, the second chapter is a, is a kind of presentation of what he calls the classical economics, which, or classical theory of unemployment, which he is rejecting. This is a classical theory, but actually, uh, Maynard Keynes was only six years older than Pigou. And Pigou, actually, Maynard Keynes dies in 1946. Pigou lived on until 1959. Uh, but Pigou is kind of seen already by the 1920s as part of a passing structure, a passing Marshallian phase. And so it's quite surprising to actually, when you read general theory, to register the, the, the position which... Uh, Maynard Keynes is arguing so strongly against in that actually the most, most important economics book of the 20th century um, is, um, is someone who's actually only six years his junior. So biography I think is important and when things are changing very fast within, uh, within institutions uh, quite small difference of age can become quite central. So this is Alfred Marshall, a young photograph of Alfred Marshall. Most of the photographs are of him as an older man with very wild hair and so forth. This is, uh, so this is Alfred Marshall. Um, he w Marshall is a very curious figure. Um, I have some notes here. He, he developed an, uh, an idea by about the 1890s that women couldn't study economics, uh, that women just didn't really have the right brains to study economics. And he also became Im Im embedded in arguments about women studying at universities. Although, in fact, in the 1870s, he had, with, with Sidgwick, uh, been very, very important in the development of women's education in Cambridge. And in fact, he married one of his students, Mary Paley. Um, and they wrote a book on economics together. So Marshall is a rather cranky, curious figure, and this crankiness is quite important to the story. Um, he came from a, a very poor background. He was born in Bermondsey in London in a very, and his very humble background, a background which most of his life he sought to conceal. It's another important and characteristic trait. Um, he was admitted, he, he went to a, a school, learned classics and maths in London, and he was admitted to St. John's College in Cambridge in 1861. And in 1865, he came out with the second top mathematics um, degree, um, where the top one was um, Lord Rayleigh, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1904. So he was, by Cambridge standards, a, 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 over that time, a very uh, astute math, uh, mathematician. He became a, a lecturer in moral sciences, however. His interest shifted away from mathematics in 1868. Um, and then, because he got married, he, became, he had to give up his fellowship, and he became the first principal of what is now today the University of Bristol. He went and became principal and he eventually went, got back to work in Cambridge. In, he was elected in 1884 to the chair. And he, the important thing about this, which I'll come to in a minute, is that he made something of this chair which it had not been before. Because the previous holder of the chair was Henry Fawcett. Um, Henry Fawcett was blinded in a shooting accident in 1858. And so this is a picture from 1872. Um, and uh, so it's Ford Maddox Brown, actually. Um, so uh, that, that itself is significant. Um, but uh, Fawcett uh, was a very robust million um, who 
interestingly, after his um, after being blinded, really was read to by his wife, Millicent Garrett Fawcett, herself an, a significant figure. Um, and uh, one of the interesting impacts of him having been blinded was that his economics, in a sense, were frozen uh, in that late 1850s position. So he was frozen in that position. But he was a Millite radical, along with Leslie Stephen. Uh, Leslie Stephen um, promoted his friend Henry Fawcett, and so first of all, he helped him write a, a kind of a, a short version of, of John Stuart Mill's uh, 1848 book on political economy, which was published in 1863 as a manual of political economy. And um, then, um, on the back of that, uh, Fawcett was elected to become professor of political economy in Cambridge. And then in 1865, Leslie Stephen helped him become an MP for Brighton. And uh, he later went on to become postmaster general as well. Because actually, although he was professor of political economy at Cambridge, that really didn't in involve any particular task of teaching. As, as you will see, is actually, so Fawcett, although he's professor of political economy, and although political economy is part of the moral sciences tripos when he is appointed, does have no direct input into that moral sciences tripos, moral sciences degree. So the third person then is Henry Sidgwick, um, uh, an interesting figure who today is uh, moral philosophers have come back to his his notable book Methods of Ethics of 1874, um, but who is a more complex figure than than many philosophers would today uh, would 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 today tend to suggest. So, Sidgwick, likewise trained in maths, and I'll I'll, I'll give you the the sequence of of training. Uh, in a minute, but basically he took a maths and classics degree in 1859. Like Marshall, he became a lecturer in moral science in 1868, and then he became the professor of moral philosophy in 1883. But interestingly, in 1883, he also published a very substantial volume um, called Principles of Political Economy, which uh, is an interesting book for, for several reasons. So those are the main persona uh, that we'll be dealing with. Fawcett I introduce mainly to point out that for a lot of the time I'll be talking about he was professor of political economy, but this didn't mean anything particular for the way that political economy developed in, in Cambridge. Now when Marshall was elected uh, in the end of 1884 as the new professor, he, his inaugural, this is held in February, the following February in 1885, he sketched out an ambition for uh, political economy, for economics, which hadn't been uh, expressed before in Cambridge. He basically had this idea of uh, economics as a technical subject which could help solve social problems in the same sort of way that we saw with um, Keynes's uh, intro to the uh, handbooks uh, before. And also the, the famous phrase which comes in this towards the end, the, the highest endeavor to send out in strong young men into the world with cool heads and warm hearts. This kind of, this image of basically technical people, technically well trained, but with a social conscience and willing to do good in the world. And this basic ethos is one that uh, Pigou, his successor, shared. Pigou famously wrote in 1920, Economics of Welfare. He initiated the area of welfare economics, the question of distribution and taxation and so forth. And also John Maynard Keynes was very much part of this same kind of uh, idea. And this connection of social ideals and technical, technical skill um, a particular kind of technical skill, is something which is the real kind of Marshallian heritage, and which is the thing which w w that uh, is undermined or, or uh, terminated, in a way, in the 1930s. So Marshall has this ambition 
he has this ambition to not only train up new socially conscious uh, young men, it is young men at the time, and particularly he doesn't, as I said, he, he doesn't see young women as a particular uh, uh, vehicle for this kind of new study. Um, and very quickly after he arrives in Cambridge, he starts setting about opening up the space for political economy within the moral sciences tripos. So we need to understand a bit more about what these what these degree well what they do in Cambridge, what students do in Cambridge, who studies and what happens. So why Cambridge, the tripos is what is the tripos? The main the main thrust of the, 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 the points that follow from this is that Cambridge, unlike Oxford, had a very competitive ranked exam, the maths tripos, which, which evolved in the first half of the 19th century. Um, it, it was rather broader to start with. It kept on changing. But basically, it became the main way in which people could um, gain social recognition, public recognition outside Cambridge. This, so basically, this was not just an exam. It was a ranked exam, and the first wrangler was the top person, the second wrangler was the second person uh, of the firsts. Um, and these were published in, in newspapers, and apparently um, wranglers were fated in their hometowns and all this sort of thing. It was actually seen as a very, a very uh, important uh, uh, examination. Um, the other side to this is that prof the professors in Cambridge um, did not lecture, no, mostly. Uh, when, when Huell started, uh, became professor in 1838, um, he, or professor of moral philosophy in 1838, he, he actually introduced uh, an annual set of lectures, which was a novelty uh, for, for any, any professor in Cambridge at that time. Teaching was college-based. Um, and that's also something which is important, we'll see. Eminence in the mathematical tripos is the prime marker of a Cambridge man. Um, the classics, the, also there is a classics uh, tripos, which is taken after the mathematics tripos. So you first gain eminence in the mathematics tripos, and then you can do a, a one-year course in, mathematic, in, in classics and take the classics tripos. Um, and there are other kind of structures which are, which are around that. But what happens in 1847 is that Prince Albert becomes chancellor of the university. Uh, he's given uh, an outline of, the, uh, of the, what the teaching is, and he's quite horrified. Uh, Albert actually studied for the, at the University of Bonn the year after that Karl Marx studied at the University of Bonn, and he studied exactly the same subjects as Karl Marx at, uh, at, uh, at Bonn. And so Albert did actually have some kind of German university background, and, and at, when compared with what was going on in Cambridge, he just really thought that what Cambridge was doing wasn't good enough. And so he was instrumental in introducing reforms and actually introducing, in 1848, two new exams, the Moral Sciences Tripos and also um, the, um, the, the, sciences tri the, the Physical Sciences Tripos. These actually, though, were still post-mathematics post qualifications. You first had to, to get a degree, or honours degree, in, in mathematics, and then you could do a one-year course in the moral sciences. And the subjects of the moral sciences were simply a compendium of who happened to be the professors at that time. They were the subjects. So it involved moral philosophy, political economy, history, jurisprudence, laws of England, um, these sorts of things. What happened then, there, were, there was a further reform movement, and in 1860, a three-year degree, honours degree in moral sciences was actually established, and the person instrumental in this was John Grote, at that time the moral uh, professor of moral philosophy, who has a very important part in our story, but who died in 1866. 
Um, so from 1860, there is a moral sciences tripos, um, but it's only um, in 1867 that the, 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 the various bits and pieces are, are chucked out of the moral sciences tripos, and that becomes, uh, and this, this holds up until 1903, um, moral and political philosophy, mental philosophy, logic, and political economy. Not unlike, really, what the, uh, the, the, the PPE in, in Oxford, but which wasn't founded until uh, 1920. So basically, we've got a rather complicated story of different kinds of examinations. But by, by the late 1860s, we've arrived at a point where there's a three-year degree. Um, that, that it has defined subjects. Um, and it, it, you don't actually need to study mathematics in order to do this. And this is part of the story also of the waning force of mathematics in Cambridge because um, by the end of the century there are other new triposes and these kind of um, meet on history comes to have a great importance and this then uh, displaces mathematics as the prime uh, thing. So. The next thing is, what is Cambridge mathematics? And this is very important for our story as well. Um, and this is a long shopping list of, of various things about this. Basically, it, Cambridge mathematics wasn't like continental mathematics. Con uh, Cambridge mathematics, the kind of drills which students were put through, were problems which in Newtonian and Euclidean or Eucl uh, uh, sort of mathematics, it was problems of diagrams and space, ge very geometric, in fact. Um, but as you can see from the top point, that it was very, very intense to actually do well in the maths tripos. You had to train very hard. As I said before, teaching was college-based. And so within the colleges, the problem uh, anyone who wanted to do well in the maths tripos faced was that any teaching went at the pace of the slowest person. And so in about the 1830s, 1840s, a system developed of external tutoring called coaches. Um, this is actually the origin of the, of the, the word coach as a trainer. Uh, it, in, in the Cambridge sense, it was that um, the, there was a, a very fast stagecoach between London and Cambridge, and the idea was that the coachman was very athletic, and this was the coach, and the coach was someone who, who drove you on. And the coaches also developed teams of, of students, who, and they, their reputation of these external coaches was relied on how well their teams did in the triposes, and that's also mostly in part the origin of the modern sense of a team as a, in a sporting sense. Because also the other leg of this is that um, in order to sustain this, this kind of activity, um, stamina was needed. Now, we're used to the idea uh, in the tw well, from the 20th century that uh, you have rowing hearties and, and rugger hearties at, um, in Oxbridge universities and these people really are, are not serious academics. That wasn't the case in the mid-century with people like Leslie Stevens and Henry Fawcett, both of whom were very keen rowers. Leslie Stevens coached the Trinity Hall 8 um, in the 1850s and early 1860s. Um, and the idea of rowing, walking, and also mountaineering um, was a way of physically developing yourself in order to sustain your activity through this very intense period of training and, and, and mental activity. And this carries on also with, uh, uh, with Pigou. Pigou is a very, very keen mountaineer, takes, takes uh, students to the Lake District. Uh, Alfred Marshall was a keen Al alpine walker not, a, not an, a mountaineer in his own right, but actually a keen walker. And ironically, the only time he ever met any of the Austrian economists of the 1880s was in, when he was on, uh, on his holidays in the Dolomites one year. So there's this kind of alpine, alpine tradition which is important and, uh, in all of this. So there's this kind of idea of, of um, 
of teams and coaching and, and, uh, and endeavor. So, um, what, what the actual process of, of learning and being trained in Cambridge mathematics involved was, ha was how to quickly solve a set of problems, a physical, uh, of, of basically mechanical or hydrostatic problems with the tools which you've been taught. Basically, this was a liberal education. It wasn't a scientific education. It was a liberal education in the sense that you were trained in techniques which you could then apply to particular physical, mechanical uh, problems and issues. Uh, and this uh, was, became recognized by the later part of the century as a kind of typical Cambridge approach to, to mathematics. Quite different. I mean, the contrast in, in, in the economic side here is that the really you could say that the main, the, princi the principal um, the theoretical economist in Britain in the later 19th century, early 20th century was uh, Francis Edgeworth, um, uh, a very brilliant person, but who had, had absolutely no formal training in, in, uh, in either mathematics or in economics. And uh, he just learnt his he learnt his his mathematics from uh, continental textbooks, and so Edgeworth's own mathematics was quite remote from uh, the mathematics of uh, the likes of uh, of Marshall and 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 John Maynard Keynes. Uh, John Neville Keynes uh, sort of dropped out of the maths tripos, and uh, so he didn't f finish that himself. So I mean, that that is also another another side of the bit about John Maynard Keynes dropping out because it turns out that we get also a divergence in the later 19th century between those economists who've gone through the maths tripos and those economists who've come through the moral sciences tripos. That those economists who've gone through the the mathematics tripos have a very strong analytical approach. Whereas those who come through, like uh, Neville Keynes, Cunningham, uh, Shield Nicholson, who come through the moral sciences tripos, actually don't have that same kind of analytical um, approach. So, just to talk a bit more about yeah. Sidrick and Marshall. Um, I've talked a bit the per about the personalities. Grote is important. I'll come back to talk about Grote in, 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 in the conclusion, the more convenient. Um, um, well, this, well, I'll talk about <laughs> a bit about him now. John Grote is important because um, he, uh, he was the person who, as it were, reformed the moral sciences tripos into the structure it had in the late 19th century. Um, and he did this mainly in arguments about intuitionism and, and utilitarianism. Now, the important point here is that in the autumn of 1861, um, John Stuart Mill published in, a, in Fraser's magazine his, what became his, his, his book, his small book on utilitarianism, as three essays. The book didn't come out until 1863. But... In the autumn of 1861, this came out. And what's interesting about this is that um, there's evidence from letters and so forth that at this time, Sidgwick and Grote were engaged in very, um, very uh, strong uh, discussions. Now, the, the timing is important because the first, um, the, the first, as it were, proper entry of the utilitarian calculus as a subjectivist calculus uh, into uh, economic thinking comes in 1862 with Jevons's paper to the British Association, um, and he doesn't present this himself. He writes it and goes. And the only the only reason you can see within Jevons's own development is that he's prompted by um, these articles by uh, um, uh, Mill the year before. Um, so there are these discussions between Grote and Sidgwick. Grote actually drafted uh, a book um, in the early 1860s on utilitarianism, 
um, but he died in 1866, and his uh, sort of, in effect, um, son-in-law, brother-in-law, his uh, mayor, uh, another Cambridge don, married his ward and edited up this as an examination of the utilitarian philosophy of 1870. Um, now, um, then in 1871, we have Jevons' Theory of Political Economy, which is the first um, modern text, a political economy text in Britain, uh, really. And then in 1874, we have Sidgwick Smith as of ethics. And the importance of getting this chronology right is that actually what Sidgwick does in his methods of, ethic, of ethics is reprise many of the points that Grote had made in his, well, in the mayor edited um, uh, volume of uh, examination of utilitarian philosophy, and there's a story I can tell about that in the discussion if you like. But so basically, what I'm trying to lay out here is the idea there's this utilitarian thread which comes through from Grote, Jevons, and um, to Sidgwick, um, and then uh, it's in '83 Sidgwick becomes a Knightbridge professor. And he publishes also his principles. And his principles is really a kind of synthesis of Mill's political economy and Jevons' um, ideas. So where we've got there is, is sort of positioning Sidgwick shortly before Marshall turns up in Cambridge. Um, in 1890, Marshall publishes his Principles of Economics. Um, so what is, so? I, well, I should say a few words about the principles of economics, really. This is, this is the, the book, which, uh, which I'll talk about later in, a, in a while, but it's the book which, when I first read it in the, in the 1970s, I thought was just ludicrous book, ludicrously simple-minded book. And the reason that I thought that was because it was so much like the economics I'd been taught in, uh, in my first-year principles lectures, that I didn't notice that, of course, that was this book originated 100 years before. And basically what, what, what Marshall did in his Principles of Economics was set up the way in which elementary economics would be taught in graphical ways with, with, uh, with supply and demand graphs and, and, and basically ideas of comp competition and market. A graphical presentation with all the mathematics in the appendix, and that was that. This is really the most important book for the for the early part of the of the twentieth century. So, what does the moral sciences tripos look like then? I mean, with all this background, what's it look like in the eighteen eighties? Uh, there's mo I'll just run through it. the basic topics: moral and political philosophy. This is taught by Sidgwick. It's moral and political philosophy. Sidgwick went on in eighteen ninety one to write a book on. Uh, elements of politics, and so modern politics was taught within the idea of moral philosophy. Um, psychology, this a lot of the, if you look at the actual um, reading lists and the, the guides, a lot of this is German. There's Fechner and, and, and uh, other other German writers in that. There's metaphysics, um, which is sort mainly taught by Sawley. Logic, which is taught by John Neville Keynes. Neville Keynes writes a textbook for, the, for this in, uh, uh, in 18, 1874, eight, sorry, 1884. Um, so um, what we can see is Sidgwick and Keynes, in a sense, write the textbooks for the moral sciences tripods. And also there's political economy. Um, in, in, in this, in a kind of fairly generic sense. And this is taught both by Neville Keynes and by uh, Herbert Foxwell, who says not by Fawcett. So in all the reading lists we have for, um, for uh, and lecture lists we have for the teaching on the moral sciences tripods, the name of, uh, of Fawcett doesn't appear at all. And this is what actually Marshall changed, because immediately he was there, he started to give lectures on advanced economics and, and, uh, and social policy. Um, so he teaches advanced, and, and Foxwell basically teaches, he's, he's shunted off to teach the elementary material. Um, it's in 18, 
91, the, the tripos is divided in two, um, and so we get choice about things we can take and so forth, and I, we'll come to some of the issues around this. So there's a kind of evolution of this, and the whole thing actually gels into a structure by the 1890s. But we know that from the uh, student guide of 1893 that teaching at this time is still college-based. Uh, that basically university lecturing is not, not the main way in which this is done. And when they say college-based, it means um, perhaps three hours lectures a day, which are in fact simply um, either workshops, in the case of maths lectures, or in, or in the case of political economy, running through particular problems and so forth. Um, also, quite soon, uh, at one point, Marshall is advoca advocating a political science tripos on the American model, um, because in America the social sciences develop um, mainly under the auspices of, of the political sciences, and so the political science quarterly is, what is the first um, sort of general social science journal in the, in the United States. So what's Marshall's project within this moral sciences tripos? So he had written this book with Mary Paley, 1879, which is actually for extension teaching. Um, he, through the 1880s, he developed his ideas and published um, then Principles of Economics. It's a conceptual and graphical foundations for undergraduate economics until the later 20th century. Um, all the algebra, as I said, was placed in, a, a gen, in, in an appendix, and basically it's, it's a, a gra a very much a graphical representation of, of, of economics, of the kind you'll see in Samuelson's textbooks as well, and which is the bread and butter, up until I think you know, the last perhaps 10, 15 years, really, um, of, of the teaching of, of economics at a basic level. Um, then what he does, uh, Marshall, he, he, uh, he's instrumental in creating what then was called the British Economic Association as a vehicle for the launching of a general economics um, period periodical, one which is not based in a university like Harvard or Chicago, like the American journals were. Um, it's a one which is broad and open to, to all currents of thought, and so the Economic Journal begins publication in 1891 on this basis, so you have a means of communication among uh, students and, and those interested in economics. And then he agitates for a separate economics tripos. He keeps on agitating to say that, that you can't teach economics within the, uh, within the moral sciences tripos because his main argument, which is one derived from his mathematical background, is that in order to train the techniques and, and, and practices you require of an economist, you require a three-year degree, and that this cannot be done within the, uh, within the moral sciences tripos. And coming back to his personality, this is also very important because, in a sense, he made himself so unpopular with his colleagues um, that eventually they sort of said, well, yes, you take your uh, economics and put it in a tripos, so long as we, uh, economics disappears from the bit that was taught under history and the moral sciences tripos. So what happens is the moral sciences tripos from that point becomes the foundation for the philosophy tripos in Cambridge. So with, with economics and politics taken out of it, it becomes uh, a moral philosophy um, and uh, logic and metaphysics. So that's that sort of a branching of the, of the things. So then there's a reorganization of the tripos. I mean, I, I can talk, I actually have done a, a study, but mo most of the, the literature which talks about the economics tripos looks at it in terms of Marshall's gaining the tripos. How did he uh, free economics from? Uh, the, the, the confines of, of the moral sciences tripos, presuming that once this had happened, then in a sense, it would be all plain sailing. I did a, 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 a study of the four and a half thousand students who passed through the economics tripos between 1903 and 1955. Um, and in fact, looking at the results these students gained, this is only the students who actually passed the, the degree, uh, so it's those who, who got the degree. 
Um, and a lot of the, looking at the personalities, look at the colleges and so forth, a lot of the actual outcomes of this degree were, um, well, questionable to say the least. Even then, actually, it's the case that, see, Marshall actually had this idea that you needed people who were socially committed and that there was a need on the part of business, administration, education, for people trained in economics. This was his basic vision. Um, but in the British case, um, he was about 50 years too early. Even in the 1930s, um, those people who got firsts in economics um, had no real chance of a job anywhere unless they knew Maynard Keynes. Um, and so there were a number of leading personalities who became later leading British economists, who um, some of them who got their first appointment through Maynard Keynes, others who didn't know for one reason or other, did very well on the tripos but did not know Maynard Keynes and he was not able to help them, who just um, stumbled around until after the war. Um, but yeah, so, you know, there was, there was no demand. In fact, um, in, in, for, in terms of government, for example, there was no regular demand for trained economists until the 1960s in, in, in Britain, with some minor exceptions. Also, what I mean, we got small numbers, but one of the things, if we look at what the the moral, if we look at the number of students going through the moral sciences tripos, it looks actually pretty small. Um, so, this is the numbers for parts one and two um, in these years. Of course, there are other students. There are a lot of ordinary. Um, degree students who will study along with these moral sciences students, but the numbers are quite small in the in the 1890s, uh, and also we have some fairly familiar kind of exam kind of comments that. Uh, then this actually is there are lots of these in the Cambridge University Reporter. Um, other just work was generally illiterate. Don't read the books. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of this actually. I mean, in the Cambridge University report, Porter, there are exa exam board reports which generally repeat this about the non mathematics students, students studying theology or students studying classics and so forth, that they really didn't understand material, they didn't work hard enough, and this sort of thing. Um, but also, one should point out that even we've, though we've got small numbers here, that in uh, 1900, we have you know, um, a very small number of students, but we have two, as it were, world-class economists who, who end up coming out of D.H. McGregor, who was a professor of political economy in Oxford after the war, um, rather knocked about by the war, and so, but he was basically a very eminent and rising star. And then, of course, Pigou, who's, who did a one-year um, part two in, in the moral sciences, and uh, then, as I say, in 1908, became uh, Keynes, uh, Marshall's successor. So we've got some conclusions or some, point, some finishing points. So we say that Cambridge is the base from which modern discipline of economics is launched. But the Marshallian version of this doesn't last very long. And the reason for this is that uh, the vision, the socially committed vision of economics was overcome, overtaken by a more technically driven, uh, formalized conception of economics, which in Britain was associated particularly with the LSE and then um, increasingly uh, with other leading universities like MIT, uh, well, well not MIT, but Harvard and, and Chicago in the United States. Um, and the, the summary, the way we can sum this up is, is that in uh, 1932, uh, Lionel Robbins, a professor of political economy in, 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 uh, at LSE, uh, defined, famously defined economics as a human behavior, as a, a relationship between ends and scarce means. This is the famous definition of what economics is. Um, and basically, it's any kind of choice. It's not a kind of idea about a box of tools and social policy and social problems. It's simply about any kind of social decision-making 
and choice making. Um, now, I mean, the caveat one should say is that this, this definition, although now it looks so obvious, did not make it into most textbooks until about the 1960s. Um, and there was still a lot of discussion and argument about what economics really was. But the interesting point about where, where did Robbins get this idea from? Where did he, how did he come up with this kind of you know, encapsulation of what economics should be? And the answer is that uh, from, from Susan Housen, who's Robbins' biographer and who looked at all his notes and, and whatever, is that it actually came from his study of the work of Philip Wicksteed. Um, 1908 work, but who also had been very active in the, in the 1880s, who had learned Javonian economics. Actually, Philip Wicksteed is the person who um, coined the, the term marginal utility um, as a translation of uh, Wieser's uh, Grenznutzen, so that uh, actually he's the person who introduced the idea of marginal utility in, into the English language. Now, Wicksteed had got his economics from, from Jevons, and as, as I pointed out, Jevons' first work, uh, utilitarian-based work, was uh, in, in 1862 um, with the British Association paper. Um, and that, on a parallel path, was also where Grote and Sidgwick were in the early 1860s. And so there's a peculiar sort of recursive element in all of this, is that although Sidgwick himself, as a, as a moral philosopher, um, and, uh, and a lot of his writings and speeches and so forth had a, had, a, had a commitment to social problems and social issues that every bit is or much greater than Marshall's insofar as Sidgwick was instrumental in developing women's education in the early 1870s in Cambridge, uh, paid for a house and became, uh, set up the Newnham Company which ended up as Newnham College and is why the social sciences Site, why, why there is a Sidgwick Avenue in Cambridge and why uh, the, the, uh, the social sciences site is called Sidgwick, uh, it's the Sidgwick site. Um, so Henry Sidgwick um, was instrumental in this kind of idea of the social issues, but did not have this same kind of mathematical driving, problem solving uh, approach that Alfred Marshall had. Instead, he had a, a more complicated, problematic, actually, ish, uh, idea of um, a, sub, a subjectivist economics and utilitarianism. I mean, in fact, say that there are, there are issues which Grote identified, which become um, again come around again in the 1930s. How do you, which problems of Mill's utilitarianism? How do you aggregate up from individual choice to uh, collective choice? Um, how do you compare utilities between people? And Sidgwick actually also, um, uh, but Sidgwick did introduce a very important point using the utilitarian idea to, um, to, to encapsulate a, an idea which today seems, in a sense, self-evident. But when he was talking about the wealth of a, a country, which would previously been thought in terms of simply an accumulation of capital or, or finance and so forth. He said, well, if you think about wealth in terms of utility, then what happens is that because of the principle of marginal utility or final utility, as he called it after Jevons, because of the principle of final utility, marginal utility, it means that the more evenly wealth is distributed in the country, the more utility, the more benefit that, that those individuals derive from it. That is, as it were, because the, the marginal utility schedules of, of poorer people um, can actually are, are structured in such a way that they can have, they, they enjoy each increment more than people who are richer. That means that the more even the distribution of wealth is in the country, the happier the more, the, the more utility there will be in that country. And that is an idea which was taken up by, by Pigou, by Marshall's student. So thank, well, thanks for listening. <laughs>